This video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream, which is just for this week at its cheapest price ever of $11.59 a year. Get access to bonus TLDR content as well as all of our videos ad free by signing up to the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal linked down below. If you're watching this video on your phone or computer, chances are that you're currently holding some rare earth elements. Today, rare earth elements, or REEs, are an integral part of modern life. They're used as components in smartphones, digital cameras, LEDs, and even semiconductors. However, they're about to become even more important, because a lot of the technology which is involved in the green transition, like electric batteries and wind turbines, require huge amounts of REEs. So in today's video, we're going to be explaining what rare earth elements actually are, where they're located, and why they become a hot topic of political debate. So before we get into the politics of all of this, what actually are rare earth elements? Well, chemists use the term to refer to a set of 17 metallic elements, the 15 lanthanides plus yttrium and scandium which both have similar chemical properties to the lanthanides, although scandium occurs far less frequently than the others and is sometimes excluded. Regardless, politicians tend to use the term a bit more loosely than chemists, and don't get so hung up on the technicalities. As such, they use it to refer to essentially any exotic metal used in advanced industry, including metals like lithium, nickel, and cobalt, which don't technically fall within the category at all. Regardless, for the purposes of this video, we're going to be using the scientific definition. Just because it's better demarcated, and, well, we can always do another video on lithium another day. Anyway, rare earth metals are often separated into light and heavy. The light elements are those with an atomic number less than 65, while the heavy ones are those with atomic numbers of 65 or over. In other words, everything to the right of terbium. With that established, let's talk about their rarity, because contrary to their name, rare earth elements aren't actually all that rare. Estimates vary, but most scientists put the combined abundance of rare earth elements in the Earth's crust somewhere between 150 to 220 parts per million. Individually, the most abundant REE is cerium, which comes in at about 60 parts per million while the rarest is probably thulium, which comes in at about 0.5 parts per million. For context, this is significantly more than many other metals which are mined on an industrial scale. Things like copper, which come in at 55 parts per million, and zinc, which comes in at 70 parts per million. So if they're not actually all that rare, why are they called REEs? Well, the issue is that unlike other commercial metals, rare earth elements are rarely concentrated into mineable ore deposits. Instead, they're found mixed into certain clay and rock deposits, so extracting them is difficult and chemically intensive. Fortunately, at the moment, none of these minerals are required in massive quantities. Global rare earth production amounted to about 240 tonnes in 2020, about 1% of the 21 million tonnes worth of copper mined in the same year. The most common use for REEs are magnets and catalysts, which accounts for 29 and 20% 20 of all REE use respectively. But it's worth saying that a significant fraction, about 8%, are being used in batteries. So, important as they are, REEs are about to become significantly more important in the coming era of renewable energy. And that's because obviously the green transition will involve a massive movement towards electric vehicles. And in turn, this will increase demand for batteries and therefore rare earth metals. In fact, it's estimated that battery demand is going to rise fivefold by 2030, which would amount to a 25% increase in REE demand in the same time frame. REEs are also really important for wind turbines, because wind turbines use magnets to generate electricity. And that's a big deal, because global wind power capacity is expected to increase tenfold to 6 terawatts by 2050 which would increase total demand for REEs by as much as 300%. 
All in all, the International Energy Agency estimates that global demand for REEs will increase by somewhere between 200 and 600 percent by 2040. Now, obviously, all of this is fairly speculative. No one knows how many cars or wind turbines will actually end up being built in the future. And future technological advantages might significantly reduce demand for REEs. However, as things stand, it looks like any country which wants to take the green transition seriously will have to invest massively into rare earth elements. Which leads us into the second part of this video. Who actually has these minerals? Well, let's start by looking at reserves, i.e. which countries have RE deposits within their territory. According to the US Geological Survey, there are an estimated 160 million tons of mineable RE deposits worldwide. And China has the world's biggest RE reserves, with 44 million tons, or about 38% of the global total. Vietnam comes in second with about 19%, Brazil in third with 18%, Russia in 4th with 10%, and India in 5th with 6%. Which leaves only 4 so-called Western countries with sizeable REE reserves. Australia has just over 4 million tonnes, Greenland and America have 1.5 million each, and Canada has just under a million. Now, it is possible that these estimates will change as new mines and extraction methods are discovered. But the basic idea is that China will have the upper hand when it comes to REE reserves. However, when it comes to actual REE production, China basically has a monopoly already. China is already responsible for producing and processing nearly 90% of the world's REEs, with the remaining production being carried out in Myanmar and Estonia. It wasn't always like this though. China only actually started processing REEs in the mid 80s. And before then, the US was the industry leader. China ended up replacing the US, partly because it has the largest domestic reserves, but also because China could just do the job a lot cheaper. Mineable rare earth deposits also coincide with all sorts of hazardous elements, like uranium, arsenic, and other heavy metals. And processing itself is very chemically intensive. China's low wages and near non-existent worker standards meant that it could undercut the US industry, even if that came at a cost to Chinese workers' health. Anyway, as you can probably imagine, all of this has turned REE production into a political affair. With the US-China rivalry heating up, hawkish American politicos have started worrying about a Chinese blockade of REE exports. And Europeans have begun to realize that while the green transition might reduce their dependence on Russian oil, renewables will increase their dependence on Chinese rare earth elements. And this all really hit the headlines in September of 2010, when the PLA blocked a routine shipment of REEs to Japan after the Japanese Navy arrested a Chinese fishing boat near the disputed East China Sea Islands. The world then quickly realized how dependent it was on Chinese rare earths, and prices spiked to all-time highs. Since then, Japan has successfully diversified its REE supply away from China, mainly by switching to Australian REEs and recycling when possible. And this effort has been pretty successful. In 2010, China accounted for over 90% of Japan's REE imports, but today that's down to 58%, and Japan reckons it will be below 50% by 2025. America has actually tried to do something similar, albeit with less success. With the help of the government, various American companies have started looking for new deposits, with the most promising being a project in Arizona. And to push the private sector even harder, in January, a bipartisan group of senators introduced a bill that would prohibit defense contractors from procuring rare earth metals from China by late 2026 and force the Pentagon to create a strategic reserve of those elements by 2025. However, despite all of these efforts, America still has only one operating rare earth mine in California, and China still supplies about 80% of the US's REEs. The EU has similarly tried to reduce their dependence on Chinese imports. To try and bring this number down, in 2013, an EU-funded project began looking for mineable deposits on the European mainland, but has so far had limited success. 
And things were made worse when the most promising mine, one in Greenland, was closed in November of last year, after a law was passed which banned exploration of deposits with uranium concentration above 100 parts per minute, which for context is considered very low grade by the World Nuclear Association. Ultimately then, the West will probably rely on China for REEs for the foreseeable future. And while precautions might make sense, the best way the West can protect its REE supply is to, well, avoid a war with China. If you want more on this topic from us, then you should check out Nebula. You've likely heard us talk about our streaming service Nebula before, but it's at its lowest price ever right now. So give me one minute to explain to you why you should care. And as always with TLDR, there's three reasons. Firstly, signing up to Nebula gets you a ton of additional TLDR content. We release some of our videos exclusively on Nebula, and those are full length proper videos, as well as a super fun studio tour. We also release longer versions of some of our videos. In fact, we release a longer version of our show, The Daily Briefing on Nebula every single day. That's a lot more TLDR for you every day. Secondly, everything on Nebula is ad free, and that's not just TLDR either. That's all of your favorite creators like Wendover Productions, Real Life Law, Polymatter, Legal Eagle, Half as Interesting, and tons of others. And it's all ad free. So there's no mid rolls, and I wouldn't even be talking to you right now. Thirdly, signing up and watching on Nebula really helps the channel. And here's the maths. TLDR viewers signing up to Nebula has significantly improved our ability to monetize our content, which has allowed us to begin employing more staff and investing in new technology to improve our content. You might not notice it quite yet, but you soon will, and signing up is super helpful to make that possible. So, you're convinced, right? Did I do it in a minute? Who knows, it's pre-recorded, but anyway, if you did want to sign up for Nebula, the cheapest way to do so is with the Curiosity Stream Nebula Bundle deal. That way, if you sign up to Curiosity Stream at the crazy low price of $11.59 a year, then you'll also get free access to Nebula as long as you're a paying member. That's right, two streaming services for less than a dollar a month. And by the way, that crazy low price only lasts for this week. And it's worth saying that Curiosity Stream is awesome. It contains absolutely boatloads of high quality documentaries on all kinds of topics that I know that TLDR viewers are going to love. So if you want both services for $11.59 a year, this week only, then the link is down below. And if not, well, I can't say I haven't tried to convince you. Thanks for your support.